visionaries and change makers. How are you today? It is Monday. It is 4 p.m. Central Time. My name is Leanne. Welcome to Lead with Leanne, where we navigate the waters of business with heart and purpose, airing every week at 2 p.m. Pacific Time, exclusively on winwinwomen.tv. By the way, my guest today from the from the West Coast. Some people say the best coast, but I like flyover country. Anyway, I'm Leanne Lyon, your chief joy officer, here to empower you with strategies, insights, and a splash of fun. Each week on Lead with Leanne, you'll join me as we delve into the inspiring stories of established leaders and innovative entrepreneurs like today. We'll uncover just what it takes to build a brand from scratch lead with authority and grace, and turn business aspirations into tangible success. So anchor down, set your sails. Let's dive into the art of joyful leadership. Get ready to be inspired because your journey to business brilliance starts right now. My guest today has been and was actually got her start with an, as an early MBA and CEO. She helped start up two French owned Napa Valley wineries, which you may recognize Chandon. I probably said that wrong, but it sounds kind of fancy and St. Supri. But now, now she's transitioned to her own entrepreneurial journey and is retired to the family vineyard and micro brewery. I'm so excited to welcome my guest, Michaela. Are you there? Come on forward. There she is. Yes. Hello. Hey, you made it. <laughs> I did All the way from the best coast. Oh, the left uh, coast. That's how I think of it. The left coast. <laughs> hey, you said it, not me. <laughs> Yes, I've heard that. Um, but you love it out there. Sure. And what did you just finish doing? You shared with this with me just before we started. What did you just finish doing this week? Oh, um, what's today? Today's Monday. Monday. Yes. Four days ago, we finished harvesting our grapes, which is always exciting because some of them we harvest for our own little winery, Villa Ragazzi, but most of them we harvest for other wineries. And so those winemakers get to make the picking decision. Uh -huh. And some of them really like to leave grapes hanging on the vine as long as possible to get the best, 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 best flavors, which for me, the grower is uh, sort of hair raising because all kinds of things can go bad, like it can get hot, which it did last week, and the grapes can dehydrate. And I get paid by the ton, so dehydration is a bad thing, right? Yeah. Shrinkage. Think shrinkage. But it, it all worked out. <sighs> so it's over and I'm glad. <laughs> over and you're done. So uh, like a thousand questions. I've been blessed to be out in Napa and um, silico and, uh, not, well, silicone too, but Napa, silicone, uh, Willamette. Yeah. Silicon. Okay. It's Thank the you. stuff that goes in surgeries. You silicone, silicon. <laughs> yeah, it's all plastic. Um, <laughs> silicon. That's true. Uh, yeah. Silicon, where they had the dot coms. Right. And, um, but I, and I've loved it. I, I've just been so blessed to stay at some amazing vineyards. Uh, we talked about that the first time we met. In fact, I went to, um, oh, now I forget the name of it. Um, I was really surprised. I did not impressing you. What's that? I didn't impress you enough. Uh -uh. I did, but yeah, I've stopped drinking that particular wine now. But it was a it was a blended wine, and um, I you know expected because I'd been to like Corbel, mm -hmm. you know, and you go to Corbel, it's like a castle. I mean, yeah. it's really, really a big deal. And then I went to this vineyard, which, you know, was selling everything. Every every restaurant I went to had this wine in it. And I'm still, I can see the image. I just can't read the bottle in my brain right now. And we got there and it was like the shack <laughs> in the middle of a vineyard. And I'm like, wow, I didn't see that coming. But, uh -huh. you know, so, but you've been around the vineyards for a while. How many yeah. castles and how many are shacks? <laughs> there are 
only two castles I can think of. I mean, literally one is a castle. All the, the, the owner transported all these castle stones from Italy and rebuilt them for $37 million. What was that one? Which one is that? It's called the Castello de Amoroso, and it's up north in Napa Valley. Okay. And then there's another one that's much older, but it's really more of a Moorish castle on top of a hill, also in Napa Valley, and not far from Castello de Amoroso. That's called Sterling Vineyards. Oh, I have been there too. Maybe yeah, that's... They have, a, they have a cool tram taking you up to the top of the hill where the winery is and a beautiful view of the valley. Oh, yeah. Gorgeous. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you are in Napa. Yeah, I am in the pretty much the center of Napa Valley in Oakville. Okay. It has become the uh, sort of epicenter of fine Cabernet in Napa. Mm. It's famous for Cabernet already, and now Oakville is really famous for Cabernet. Oh, well. So we're well, growing some Cabernet. Good idea, huh? I, you know what? I like <laughs> it. Cabernet is good. Um, I used to drink more Merlot and I was really like, I drink Merlot. That's what I drank. And then somebody introduced me to Pinot Noir and I'm like, Ooh, I actually like this a little bit more, but I'll drink pretty much any red <laughs> <laughs> and blends are just fine. Yeah. Well, we'll have to start working on you about white wines and sparkles. Yeah, There's some whites I, I do enjoy like a uh, Cabernet, a uh, Sauvignon Blanc is great. Um, yeah. Cabernets, though, I just don't think you're ever going to get me there. I do understand the complexity and the stuff of it, but I just don't, it just never, really rarely do I enjoy a Cabernet, uh, 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 Chardonnay. Oh, Chardonnay. Yeah, that's not on my list either, but it could be with some stylistic changes. Sure. And what's your favorite then? Well, it depends on what I'm doing. Obviously, I love Sangiovese because that's what we make at Villa Ragazzi, and it's a very versatile wine. Um, I like Cabernets as long as they're not overblown, and a lot of them are. There's a lot of sort of fancy winemaking going on. Um, Chardonnay, I gave up on years ago because I was put off by all the oak and butter and all that stuff. But if you get an unoaked Chardonnay, the, the fruit comes through, and it's actually quite nice. Uh, mm -hmm. Chardonnay is a good way to discover that. And Sauvignon Blanc has been a favorite for a long time. Yeah. 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 And um, yeah, there, there are so many. I mean, it's just a delight to try the different things. It just really is. I'm um, going through the Willamette Valley. Excuse me. <coughs> um, we picked that because it was kind of known for Pinot Noirs. And yet I found a three, I think it was called Three Graces or Five Graces Vineyard, where I ended up getting a. I think it was a white that I ended up buying, getting from there that I really ended up enjoying quite a bit. Excuse me. Yeah, well, just discovering wine is, is it's, it's A, it's different every year. And there's so many different grape varieties. And now with climate change, people are really starting to look at non-traditional varieties that they haven't grown before that might be better able to cope with climate change. But, you know, yeah. establishing a vineyard takes a long time. So that's not something you undertake on a whim. You really think it through before you do that. <laughs> Yes, indeed. In fact, I think um, the first time I saw, well, first time I saw a glass cork, um, I thought that was really fascinating. Yeah. And I think they still do that. Miomi, though, haven't they gone? I think Miomi was the glass cork, if I'm not wrong. But um, now they're, they're a twist off. Yeah, well, they've gotten quite large. Yeah, they have. They have, and they, they also put uh, sealing wax on the top of their bottles, which is almost impossible to get off. It's really annoying. <laughs> that may be why they went to screw caps. <laughs> oh, maybe, maybe, yeah. indeed. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I'm still struggling with that, with that one vineyard that was like this little box in the middle of, <laughs> I will come up with it by the end of the show. come back when you're not expecting it. I will. And we'll stop the I conversation and you can tell us what it is. <laughs> exactly. And, uh, you know, I, for, I failed to mention you are an author as well. I forgot to slide that into your bio. Yeah, yeah, um, well, tell me about your book. Well, um, it's all about basic. It's hard to say about this, but it's all about my career in the wine business. And um, I wrote it because a friend who was actually a book editor said, you know, Michaela, you really ought to write a book because I was telling her all these stories about things we'd been doing at Chandon and then later at St. Supri. And she's like, you ought to write a book. And instead of doing the smart thing and just 
making notes and sticking them in the box for when I would have time to work on a book. Mm -hmm. I just didn't do that. So when the time came when I could write a book, I sat down and wrote a book basically from memory, which wow. is what imagines uh, got some holes in it. It wasn't meant to be a comprehensive book. It really is what I remembered from all those years in the wine business, and I'm still in it. But, um, and I didn't really know how to start it or end it. And, and, and then I read the autobiography of Mark Twain. And he had the same problem, Mark Twain. He wanted to write an autobiography because that was how he planned to support his family after he died was on the proceeds of his autobiography because he was pretty famous pretty early in his career. And he just in fits and starts tried starting at one end and the other end and the middle and, and finally, just gave up and said, oh, hell, I'm just going to write whatever comes into my head. And <laughs> for him, at the same time, stenography was invented. Wow. So he hired a woman who knew shorthand, and he would spend all morning dictating to her whatever popped into his head, whatever random story or thought. And then she'd spend all afternoon transcribing it, and then he'd edit it that night, and then they'd start again the next morning. And he wrote three volumes of autobiography in less than a year that way. And it's really fun to read. But they, uh, he gave all his papers to the Bancroft Library at UC Berkeley. And they spent years trying to figure out how to organize <laughs> all these, you know, daily. It's like daily rushes in the films, only there's no rhyme or reason to how they fit together. So it's wow. a really interesting read. If you get a chance to read that autobiography, I recommend it. Oh, that does sound really good. And so set me free to write my own book by just sitting down and starting to write. There you go. Yeah. And, and I would say actually I organize it later. I was actually looking down because what I've been doing, because I am also working on a book, oh, is I got an app called Otter, O T T E R. And so whenever things pop into my mind or I'm pondering a new concept or something's affected the way I'm seeing the world. I just do an audible. I just start talking into it. So stenographer, right? It's just my stenographer on my phone. And it actually does do summarizations. Like, so I can, like last night, I, I actually recorded two things. One was 25 minutes. The other was 40. And then it kind of gave a summary of what each one was. It's not perfect, but it's no. just enough. And if I, when I get to hear my own voice, I know what I was saying. So yeah. I can go back and correct. And my thought is, my thought process as I continue through the journey that I'm planning to document is mm -hmm. that I'll be able to kind of grab all these transcripts and throw them in and say, okay, let's let's organize these into a, in a fashion that makes sense. Maybe artificial which is probably. Help you with that. Which is what? The AI can help you with that. When exactly. The part. I mean, and most likely it's going to be chronological. I actually was, this all actually came as a download at, 3 a.m. on August 30th, 2023. Not that it was noteworthy. Yeah. <laughs> and at the time, it not only you know was given to me, and I say by faith, I'll say that I was going to write this book and it was to be this way and I was supposed to do a certain thing. And it, the organization was actually laid out for me at that time. And yeah. so now I do actually need to go back to, it turns out I have 40 plus journals I've written over the years for you yep and so i've worked with a, a or talked to an editor and she said yeah you need to start going back there reread all those journals and see which pieces need to come into you know what you're putting together so it's well, not well, for anybody know. who wants to write a book that's very good advice yeah, I, yeah. Think I had to rely on my memory and what i found out from a, a, a friend of mine who's a management consultant who i'd asked to read the, the uh, draft he yeah. said, you know what you've done, Michaela, don't you? And I said, well, I was thinking it was like a memoir. He goes, you've written a business book. I said, really? Well, of course it's about business, but you know, that was the context of it. But he said, yeah, it's full of business lessons. I said, okay, that's interesting too. And he said, so I'll prove it to you. So he opens the book and at a random chapter says, there's a lesson in that paragraph and there's another one over here and another one over there. And it's because I, that's when the light bulb went on for me. And what had happened was that I, the things I remembered were things that I had learned something from. <laughs> right. That's why they were all lessons. And some were good ones and some were bad ones. And, you know, but it was. Can you worked. share one of those lessons with us here today? Oh, let me think. There were so many. Um, yeah. 
Well, one of them was about hiring, well, going to the mat with my boss, you know, over something that I thought was really important, which was hiring, uh, this was at St. Supri, and we had 500 acres of vineyard, which is a lot of vineyard land, and in a fairly ch challenging microclimate in the Napa Valley. And I, uh, my vineyard manager, previous one had left. And so I was looking around to hire somebody and it's very hard to find somebody really good to run vineyards. There are people out there, but there aren't very many of them. It's kind of like trying to find a good CFO, also very difficult. So I interviewed a whole bunch of people and most of them struck me as being sort of burned out, you know, one trick ponies. They hadn't learned anything new in a long time. And so I was pretty, pretty worried about that. And um, a friend of mine who was the retired VP of Viticulture for Simi Winery over in Sonoma had been helping me with the interviews, bless his heart, out of, just out of the goodness of his heart. And finally, we were talking about this problem and he said, well, you know what? Why don't we hire somebody young out of Davis UC Davis, which has you know the big viticulture program, the wine business, and I'll spend up to three years training it for you. And I said, wow, yes, that's a great idea. Let's do that. So I tell my boss in France what we're going to do, and he nearly has a coronary at the idea of hiring some kid right out of school, even though my friend is extremely experienced and just, uh, just retired, you know, full career as a viticulturist and vineyard manager. And finally, I just, you know, I was on the point of quitting over this pushback from my boss because I had really reached the end of my rope with this process. And I think he finally realized that that was going on. And so he backed down and we proceeded with the plan. And we hired a guy who had just finished a master's degree in agronomy, which is not viticulture. It's more general. Okay. Ready for that? Okay. So he had had one viticulture class in his six years at Davis. <laughs> and so we hired, I liked him right away. And I knew that my friend could train him and he's obviously a really smart kid. So, and we hired him and within two years he was up and running and on his own and he was fabulous. Just terrific. Yay. That was so, great. I'm curious what years, you know, it doesn't have to be exact, but roughly what years were these that you're talking about? What, what? That would have been in uh, sometime between 95, 98, maybe. 95, okay, so late in mid 90s. Yeah. Um, and the reason I ask is that, you know, one, one conversation we sometimes have on this talk, is, you know, because I'm talking primarily with women um, and entrepreneurs, and I have had the immense blessing of meeting some women who were entrepreneurs in like the 60s or the 70s when it was really unheard of. I met a, I met a computer programmer. She actually went to the same U University of Wisconsin schools I did. And she was a computer programmer. And we just, ah, it was such a fun conversation. Um, but, you know, as I've talked with women that have been in business through a lot of different decades, things have changed for women. Have you noticed that as well? Oh, sure. Well, I got the question about that a lot when I was the CEO of St. Supri, which yeah. I, I joined St. Supri, which is a family owned French winery that was brand new, just like Chambon was yeah. um, in 1998, at the end of 98. And, you know, this is actually quite funny. He wanted me to be the general manager. My boss wanted me to be the general manager. And to me, that sounded like managing a hotel. So I said, no, no, I don't think so. But he wanted to be the president. That's fine. So I said, well, how about I be the CEO? And he goes, okay. And I don't think he knew what CEO meant, to tell you the truth, what it stood for. <laughs> but it didn't matter. So I was the CEO and he was the president. And um, as a CEO and in you know, a, a startup that was going to be of a certain magnitude in, in Napa, uh, yeah. I got a lot of attention from the press. But I already had a lot of friends in the press from my days at Schaumbaum, which was also a really good story when it was just starting up. So, um, you know, I got a lot of publicity, but for me, it was all about the winery. Okay. Any publicity is good publicity if it gets your new brand out in front of people's faces. Right. So mm -hmm. that worked very well. Um, and I got asked all the time, what's it like to be a female CEO in the wine business? 
And I go, Ugh. it's the winemakers, the women winemakers in Napa feel exactly the same way about that question for winemakers. What does it matter that I'm a woman? I'm a winemaker. Stop asking me that dumb question. <laughs> but for me, at St. Supri, being asked that dumb question was actually very helpful for the winery. So I didn't mind it. But it is kind of a dumb question. <laughs> had, um, there weren't very many. I mean, I really was kind of like a unicorn in those days. The other women who were running wineries were like family members. Of, of the family winery or they were winemakers that really weren't managers but had the, the, the business wasn't big enough to have um, a CEO or a president and a winemaker <laughs> so they just combined all the, the jobs together yeah well so like a lot of small of businesses professional manager you know so I, I just got all this attention which I thought was great for the winery so and, when did you I'm start about fortune magazine this is so funny I mean oh. I got Okay, so in 1990, I was still pretty fresh at um, uh, St. Supri. I get a call from an editor at Fortune Magazine who tells me that she's, and I didn't know her, but she just called me up out of the blue. And she said, well, we're doing this story on women in the wine business. And I said, stupid me, oh, that again. <laughs> and as soon as it came out of my mouth, I thought, oh, you dumbbell. No, 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 no. This is too good. You can't screw this up. So, so I backed up and I said, well, of course, there's many, many angles to a story like that. And, you know, and then I started giving her all kinds of story ideas. And um, the story came out eventually. And I was one of, I think, half a dozen women that were featured in the story. And I'm the only one who got a great big picture because I'm the only one who showed up in a, in a blazer um, for the photo shoot because all the rest of them were winemakers and they always wear jeans and vests right that's the uniform so the new yorkers back there the editors look at my picture and they go oh yeah there's somebody we can identify with <laughs> it was a double spread picture of me with this headline that said breaking the wine glass ceiling oh. and i nearly blew the whole thing <laughs> uh, funny yeah. Speaking of which, you have a copy of your book. I have a copy too. And it's just, I think I left it on my boat because I was reading it this summer. Um, but can you show us a copy of your book? And unfortunately, for those of you who are just listening, um, it's called From Bubbles to Boardrooms. And it has a beautiful picture of a champagne bottle. Um, yep, by Michaela. Rodeno, R-O-D-E-N-O. -E Did I say it correct? Rodino, actually. Rodino. Okay. Michaela is spelled M-I-C-H-A-E-L-A. -E and then Rodino is yeah. R-O-D-E-N-O. -E so check this out. I mean, it is a business book and it's very entertaining with all the stories and all the ins and outs because there are ins and outs when yeah. you go into business. So you said you kind of started in the wine business in 1990? Yeah, I started in the wine business in 1972. 1972 so you were four and no <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's right I was four no I was quite young and and I just walked into my husband who liked wine he's a lawyer was offered a job here in Napa by okay. a law firm and I didn't have any better ideas of what to do with myself I was one year out of grad school and um so here we go to Napa and I have a master's in French literature, which is probably one of the least useful degrees you can have if you're expecting to work for a living. <laughs> and we were here not six months when Moad Hennessy announced that they were going to spend millions of dollars building a winery in Napa. And I thought, oh, that's a French company. Perfect. So I started asking around, who are these people and where are they? I need to talk to them. And uh, it took about two weeks of uh, networking around among the legal people. Uh, group here in Napa to find that the president, the founding president, was working out of his garage on Mount Veeder. So I jumped in the Alpha and drove up Mount Veeder and knocked on the garage door and said, Hi, I speak French. Do you need help? <laughs> and he looks at me like I've dropped out of the sky, which I had, and said, uh, Yeah, I, I guess so. <laughs> you know, the company was two months old at the time and there were no other employees. There were some guys planting rootstock outside. Um, so I just spent two years in that garage in the same room with him doing all this startup stuff. It was so much fun. 
It was really, wow. really fun. But you had a you you had a master's degree. Oh, well, you said MBA. I thought a business business. I did that later. I did that oh, yeah, later. later. Okay. I did that while I was working at Ben and Shumba. When what? I did I did the MBA at Berkeley while I was working at Shumba. Got it, Shumba. Okay. So by the time you got there, given your experience, how hard was your MBA? <laughs> well, um, it was it's very though. You know, it's it's uh, I had to do a lot of prerequisite work because I had studiously avoided anything smacking of science of math as an undergraduate. <laughs> <laughs> I spent a year doing um, prerequisites. Uh, I think I had to take the GRE, but I don't really remember. That wasn't a problem. Okay, uh, and I did the evening program at Berkeley because I was working full time. Sure. And the way they had it set up then, it's much more flexible now. But the way it was set up then was that you could take one class a semester, no, a quarter. We were on the quarter system, and that was uh, one class three nights a week in mm -hmm. San Francisco, which for me was an hour commute. Right. Or you could take two classes, which was two nights of six hours each. And between working full time, I mean, one class was quite doable. Two classes was nearly impossible. Right. And I so was how long did it take you? Hmm? How long did it take you to get through the classes? Three years. Three years. Okay. And so with that, though, I mean, you're you're you can only take one class, but were there some classes where you're like, man, I could I could have passed the final on day one. Well, I wouldn't have wanted to do that, you know, because yeah. these were all things that were new to me. I mean, it was a, a very broad business education. You know? Yeah, it, it, it was known as a quant school in those days. So there was a fair amount of math and uh, homework, you know, and, and, you know, some paper writing and stuff like that. But it was it was hard work for somebody like me. And I got it. I had to take calculus as a prereq because I had never taken that. Wow. Um, yeah. But but what really it. I actually really enjoyed doing that program because every class I took was like a little laboratory for the job I was doing. I could take the topic of the class and just find a way to apply it right away to my everyday job. So it really brought school to life for me and it vastly enriched my thinking about what business is all about. You know, because over, over time, I got more focused in a narrower focus after the startup days when I was really very closely involved with the president doing everything he didn't feel like he wanted to do and it was more than enough interesting stuff for more than two people um later on I got into marketing and that's a little narrower right I mean it's really interesting and it's a lot of fun and I enjoy it but it doesn't make you think holistically about a business the way um going to biz school was mm -hmm. which was great prep for the CEO job yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. My, my daughter is, I mean, times have changed. Um, my oldest daughter went to college. She became a teacher like, like her mom. Um, mm -hmm. I told her not to, I was like, you burn out. Cause I did. She did. She burned out. <laughs> and uh, now is very happy in another career, but she finished her entire four-year degree in 22 months. Some people are in a hurry to get out of school. My daughter was like that too. Yeah. Well, but on top of it, you know, it's just a different system. So it's an online school called Western Governors. And what was beautiful about it is she could wake up on a Monday, take a pretest, essentially assessing what do you already know mm -hmm. that we want you to know by the end of this class? Mm -hmm. And if she, you know, then, then she would dive into the things she didn't know. She would learn those things or do those requirements, you know, write those papers or whatever, but she would only take one course at a time, but she could complete a, a, a class in as little as a week. Wow. Well, yeah. they did so not she, have that kind of stuff in those days. <laughs> no, no, they wouldn't yeah. have been possible. So she actually completed mm -hmm. um, 36 credits per semester. Per, and my, my semester is actually, they do six month blocks. So mm -hmm. from what, and they could start any time of the year. So they would start, you know, she started in April. She had six months to do as many as she could. Then we paid again, six months to do as many as she could, paid again. And that's mm -hmm. how she, in 22 months, she had gone through all, all the requirements to have a four-year degree. But she went back, got her master's degree in six months. Again, following the same protocol. 
and she got a, a master's degree in education uh, again just but just she was very dedicated she spent a lot of time studying there was no, this was not like oh yeah I occasionally threw down a book no it was daily studying all weekend studying to accomplish what she did but it's just a very different world a lot of things are different and yeah, there, are, there are a lot more flexible ways of doing these degrees i mean berkeley now has probably four or five different ways you can go at an mba um, yeah absolutely time for two years and and have all your classes on campus you can do it all over zoom you can do long weekends once a quarter or twice a quarter i mean they're very very flexible and meant to make it easier for people who have a job they don't want to give up or can't afford to give up while they're working on their degree. Right. And that's, it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing. So you kind of essentially stumbled into. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Becoming a serendipity. Was my middle name. Fun. I mean, it wasn't like you woke up and, you know, when you were six years old and said, I want to work in a vineyard someday. It never occurred to me. It was not on my radar. I, I literally did not know what I wanted to do, but and I never would have imagined this. In fact, when we came to Napa, I thought my husband had lost his marbles completely because what I knew about Napa was this was in you know the early seventies. It was just coming back to life after a very long hiatus. Oh, like, yeah, it was Napa was producing award winning wines back in the eighteen seventies and eighteen eighties. Oh, really. Yeah, and then this bug, an American bug called phylloxera, destroyed the vineyards. Oh, before anybody could figure out what to do about that, it was World War One, oh. and then it was Prohibition, and then it was the Depression, and then World War Two, and then some more wars. And it really wasn't until the 1960s that it started coming back to life. There were about two dozen wineries in Napa when we came in '72. Two and dozen. Our, 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 two dozen, yeah. And they had, some of them had survived prohibition by making sacramental wine, which was an exception in the Volstead Act. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Tricky, tricky. Uh, all, all those good Catholics out there who needed to have wine. Well, okay, that's fine. <laughs> so I have a funny story about but that. But now they're like, yeah, I bet. My yeah. pastor is telling the story. He um, was, you know, worked kind of behind the scenes. You know, he's always involved. He'd always been involves with church but one time he went back to the green room after a day of where they'd had communion and he went back there and he saw this lady and she's like drinking the leftover wine <laughs> and he's like ah that's fine he says <laughs> turns out because yeah. of, you know the, the the belief system of the church they they couldn't throw it out well yeah they believe, you know, they believed it's actually the blood of Christ. They were like, yep, we can't just dump it down the drain. So <laughs> literally it was, but on top of it, there's a little more to it. This particular church was the type of church where they had the chalice. Yeah. So everybody in the congregation. <laughs> had this would not work during COVID, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. Not. This is many wow. years ago, but everybody during, yeah, everybody. In the, so I had sipped and backwashed <laughs> this wine that this poor woman <laughs> had to finish off. <laughs> so I'm not saying that there was a ton of wine in this chalice left over at the end, but it couldn't be just, you know, disposed of in any, in any real way, but kind of funny when you bring up the sacrificial wine. Oof. For anybody wondering what sacrificial wine was, that would be what it is as part of. Well, when I was a kid going to communion and all that, I'm, I am a very fallen away Catholic, but um, we didn't get to, well, I was a kid, maybe that's why. I don't think the, the parishioners got to taste the wine, only the priest did. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, Catholicism has its own rules. <laughs> yeah. um, my sister was married in a Catholic church. I couldn't commune because I wasn't Catholic. Um, but others, other denominations are much more open. It just depends on the denomination, the beliefs and their interpretations. So, um, no judgment. Um, but there's that. Um, so you had no idea really that you're going to, and yet this is really the only career you've ever had. I mean, I mean, you went into what you said right out of master's program did you have a career or job before that at all 
I had a, I had a part-time job at Sacramento. Gregory's first job was working for the Corps of Engineers in Sacramento. So I just looked around and grabbed whatever kind of a job I could have. But I, my first real job was actually at Shamla. Wow. And it's the infancy, which was amazing. And I was wow. looking for this guy who was, oh man, he, he marked me for life without even trying to. He had been a management consultant, which meant he'd never run a company before, right? <laughs> <laughs> all that consultants they come in and they kind of look around and tell you what you're doing wrong and right and you know and then they leave <laughs> right and you take advice or you don't well um so this was his he what tagged him to run this company because he had written a big, big study on the future of wine in america which at that time was not obvious the champagne market in the u.s was about a hundred thousand cases which is nothing wow um, and it had been that for a long time. So, but they, the people at Moet, the chairman at, at Moet was um, a resistance hero in addition to being an accountant and very smart guy. And he was building uh, Moet up from just another small champagne house to the biggest one at the mall. And he really had his eye on the US market because he could see the potential there. It's just that it had never been realized. It's yeah. still not fully realized, but it was really you know, kind of a backwater for one. At the time, anyway, so uh, John Wright, that was his name, my boss, uh, wrote this study for Arthur D. Little. And instead of um, having someone commission the study and pay Arthur D. Little for it, what he did was propose it to Arthur D. Little. And then they went out and sold the study to a okay. number of different um, international firms that were also interested in the U.S. And what just really lit up, that was right up their alley. And so, but they didn't want to read the thing because it was, you know, Back of paper about six <laughs> so they and in English too so they invited him to come over to Champagne and uh, just make a presentation to them and he and the chairman hit it off and the chairman said right I've been wanting to do this for a long time and I want you to do it <laughs> and my boss who had been a home winemaker as well as a management consultant <laughs> turned into the president of this new enterprise and he didn't like managing people. It just <laughs> never learned how to do that, and he wasn't interested in learning how to do it. And you know, after about a month in that single room with him, I realized that he didn't know a whole lot better than I did what to do about anything. You know, uh -huh. we were all just winging it, and that that was very liberating for me. So I just thought, yeah, okay, I, whatever it is, I'll figure it out. I can do this. Wow. And, and so you just jumped online and you figured it out. You looked things up online and, oh, wait, this is. I, excuse me. Right. No, 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 not online. There was I no know. Internet. No. Yeah. The only technology we had was an eight party phone line. Eight parties. The other what? seven parties were not very happy with us. <laughs> and I know it's hilarious. And a desktop copier that had a mouse mist in it that fouled up the inner workings. But you know, it didn't matter. You looked things up. You talked to people. You just, or you yeah. just used your own imagination, right? Um, yeah. And yeah. That's how we did things, and it was really fun because it was all just a big voyage of discovery. The only, the only knowledge really was came over from champagne was technical knowledge, the winemaking itself, and the, the how you grow champagne grapes. And so they sent a really great guy over who was the chef de cave from Mercier to um, spend uh, you know, a couple of months with us every six months or so. And well, I was, thought of the vineyard. I remembered the name. Yeah. It's Menage a Trois. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's part of the uh, Trinquero family now. Yeah, the, so part of the which? Trinquero. Have you okay. ever had um, White Zinfandel? No, that's Sutter Home, sorry. No, the yeah. Trinqueros have- um, um, They have a, I'm looking at- the a yeah. photo of the bottle right now. And of course, they've gone on to a lot of other, you know, they have lots of other versions of it. But at the time, it was, you know, now they've got decadence and all this stuff. But we just thought it was really funny, the name of it. But there's well, actually... It's actually true. Of it. The founders of that winery yeah. were... One of them was a psychiatrist. The other one was his brother. And I think it was the psychiatrist's wife, who was the third leg of that stool. Oh, okay. It was, you know, it was a long time ago, and they sold the winery eventually, so the Trinqueros own it now. 
Yeah, it was Foley. Uh, de, um, I'm looking for. <laughs> oh, I yeah, de... yeah, I think so. Well, that just means a shared um, folly. Oh, shared madness. Hmm. So, menage a trois, you know, that is a different sort of a thing. But there's a winery called that too. Yeah. So anyway, that was what we wanted to go find. We wanted to see it. And then it was like a shack the size of my office in the middle. It was like nothing. They had no nothing grand. They had no tasting room. Like it was nothing. <laughs> I'm like, wow, this is not what and we and we went quite a ways to see it because again, it's not an expensive wine at all. But um, you know, when we were in our twenties, it was the affordable wine that actually tasted pretty good. Um okay. yeah. Funny. Well, actually, you know, our little winery is so little that I do tastings in our backyard uh, on the piazza here behind my oh, house. Love that. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I've been really blessed to be out in many, many different. Now, we even have vineyards here in Minnesota, if you can believe it. I believe uh, it. Every you know. state has. Well, they have wineries. Not every state has vineyards. Minnesota must be very tough in the winter on vineyards. It's pretty tough. Yeah. But I do see, you know, they, and we, but we have a lot of apples as well. And so I think some of them are also doing other things, but, um, when we were married, we had, we got our champagne from Corbell and mm -hmm. then we went to St. Croix vineyard, which is, uh, St. Croix, Wisconsin, right across the Mississippi. And there's a vineyard over there. We, we were able to purchase a red and a white that were, uh, that were, did not have labels on them. So we were able to create, you know, create our own labels with our names on it. And they ended up being souvenirs for people. And of course, I th I still think we have a bottle around here someplace 29 plus years old that um, may or may not still have wine in it. I'm not sure I'm going to open it ever. <laughs> Might be fun. Actually, be. I opened a gallon jug of Folia Vineyard Sacramental wine called Burgundy. That I acquired in 1972 from Bodie. Oh. Wow. And uh, we recently, it was a jug, a gallon jug with one of those little pant rings, you know, and a screw cap. No, a gallon is a lot of wine. And and we opened it up for a visiting chaplain because he was really interested in wine. And it was delicious. It was made from Pinot Noir because it was labeled Burgundy, which means that it's going to be Pinot Noir. And um, it was in very good shape. And it would have been made by Andre Chelichev, who's one of the, you know, sort of mythical winemakers from around here, who was just retiring when we got there. Yeah. Wow, very cool. That's well, this has been a delightful conversation. We're already like 45 minutes into it, believe it or not. So I have a couple quick, couple last minute questions. First of all, I want to remind everybody we're having a, this lovely, lovely conversation and fascinating history and everything else with Michaela Rodino, R-O-D-E-N-O, -E author of From Bubbles to Boardrooms. Which is available on Amazon. Which is available on Amazon. Uh, go, go grab that. If people want to connect with you, though, and then I'll, I have a final question or two, but if people want to connect with you, um, where is the best way to connect with you on on um, social media or whatever else? Uh, well, I'm on Facebook, and I also have a page for Villa Ragazzi, which is the name of our winery, Villa, and then Ragazzi is R-A-G-A-Z-Z-I. So okay. Ragazzi. Ragazzi means kids. Means what? Kids in Italian. Kids. Oh, okay. Bambini are children and ragazzi are kids, you know, with some sprezzatura. Got that? Got that. Got that. <laughs> now, do you speak more than French? Th or have you just... I, I understand Italian pretty well because it's very similar to French. Yeah. I speak Swedish and it actually did quite well in France and even Italy. I could decipher things a little bit. I could not translate, but I could make a fairly educated guess at a few things, at least. It was very fun. Uh, uh, so travel advice, Italians are very nice to visitors and will help you. You know, they'll make an effort to understand you. Friends? Not so much. Maybe they're nicer than they used to be, but it used to be like if you pronounce something wrong, they would deliberately misunderstand you because you massacred their language and they were offended. <laughs> So I was in France in 1990 when I lived in um, Sweden as well. We went to visit France and I went with a girlfriend that I'd met through Swedish language camp when we were quite young. 
And she spoke just a little bit of French <laughs> and her just a little bit of French was so miserable. And I mean, I, I love her. She wanted to do her best. She wanted to try it, but we spent, we wasted hours of her just a little bit of French trying to communicate. And I'm like, and, but they wouldn't speak English. Yeah. And so we got to one place. I don't remember where we were. And they said, you know, people in, in other countries, we would travel through Italy and we went to um, Athens and all sorts of places. And they'd say, you know, people trying to find a language that was common because Swedish isn't very popular. Yeah. But um, one person said, you know, probably go Francais. And she's like, we, oui. and I was like, no. <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> so let's let's find me another of, option. Very funny. When I was a TA, while I was working on my master's, I was a teaching assistant. Uh -huh. uh, so I was yeah. teaching undergraduates French. And one of my colleagues who was from Brooklyn, I mean, this is the Davis in here in California, she had a very thick accent from Brooklyn. And guess what? That showed up in her French speaking too. Uh -huh. And unfortunately, she was a really good teacher. So all of her students learned French with a Bronx accent. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Well, here's the fun part for me was that we got down to Greece and we took a boat out to an island. I can't remember the one right offhand. As we disembarked from the boat onto this little island, this gentleman walked up to me speaking Swedish. Oh, my God. And it's so a very Greek man speaking Swedish with me. And I am fluent, so I was able to respond. And then finally, I was like, "Man, her added to do that that your sense. How is it that you know that I'm Swedish?" And he goes, "Well, obviously you're Swedish." And it just that a lot of Swedish people go down to Greece and go out on these islands because they have four month, four weeks of vacation every year, and they usually take it all in a lump sum, often spending it down there. So he had learned everybody's Swedish, really right? <laughs> well. And and I'm fully blooded Swedish. So the reality is I do look Swedish. I'm just not what Americans think a Swedish woman is going to look like. But um, but my sister and daughters, all blonde hair, blue eyed. Yeah. <laughs> so this is just fake blonde now at this point. Um, and it's not fake. It's just, you know, gray blonde. Okay. So, all right. So definitely check out her book. Look her up on social media. But I have one last question. Mm -hmm. Given that you kind of fell into what you did. I'm going to ask you to go back to when you were younger, you know, go back to when you were in high school and you said you didn't really know what you wanted to do. What was your undergraduate in? Well, I backed into a French major. Okay. You backed I, into a French major. Junior year in Bordeaux at the University of Bordeaux. Oh, lovely. All the, all the students from the Cal campuses, if they went to France for their junior year, landed in Bordeaux. But you didn't drink any wine there, right? Oh, that's where I learned to drink wine, but it was... <laughs> um, not very good wine because I didn't have any money, right? I was a student. So um, by the time I came back as a senior, it was easier to be a French major, major than anything else. So I was a French major and then the French department offered me a job, you know, if I'd get a master's yeah. and that, that suited me quite well because when I returned from France, I met my husband to be who was a first year law student. So I finished my degree at the same time he finished his degree. Oh, perfect, I love that. It's just uh, things just kind of fell into place like that. Right. Yeah. Well, I learned to drink good coffee in Sweden. I will say that's where my coffee <laughs> started for sure. Um, yeah. So back in so high school and then you think junior high school and junior high school, you know, you're too young to really work. Maybe you're babysitting. But right mm -hmm. before junior high or whatever we called it, junior high is probably for us, but middle school in that, you know, fifth, sixth grade age. Mm -hmm. Do you remember what you would do? For fun. I mean, you were old enough that you didn't have to be supervised every minute, but young enough that you couldn't have a job. Do you remember what you would do for fun? Um, well, I remember building a gigantic city on a huge pile of dirt and gravel at a friend's house. Yeah. Some dump truck had put there. That, well, it's hard to remember. I mean, we moved every year. My father was a naval officer. So you know, every year we would pack up and move to somewhere else. Mm -hmm. and, you know, it wasn't your typical childhood, I think. Did you spend a lot of time reading? Did you yes. spend a lot of time yeah. outside? I was a big reader, yeah. Big reader. Everybody in my family was, yeah. Okay. Of course, you know, when you have one television and two adults and four kids, 
if we all want to watch something different, except there really wasn't any much of anything to watch anyway. <laughs> but, yeah. you know. And where would you but, read? Where would you pick up your books? What would you read and where would you read it? Um, I would read pretty much anything. I liked mostly fiction. Uh -huh. uh, Nancy Drew was a big favorite for a while there. Yeah, of course. Um, and I read in bed a lot. I got in trouble for doing that because I wanted to read so much. Yeah, that I would just have a flashlight under the covers. Flashlight under the covers. <laughs> yep. Did you ever hear of Trixie say, you're going to ruin your eyesight? And sure enough, I did. But I think that was going to happen anyway. <laughs> so. did, you, did you ever hear about Trixie Belden? Um, who's that? Trixie Belden was a version, a, a, kind of a spinoff of Nancy Drew. And in the Trixie Belden book, she was actually like the the middle class neighbor of Nancy Drew. So Nancy Drew, of course, was a very, uh, you know, she, she had some money. You know, she had some stuff. Trixie Belden was the middle class, um, lived in a small home, had a brother, you know, rode her by kind of a tomboy compared to Nancy. Well, I was sort of a tomboy, but I had three brothers I grew up with. Sure. Yeah, yes. It didn't happen until I was 14. So I was surrounded by boys all the time. And I just thought I was one of them. Uh, until I found out I couldn't go to Boy Scouts with my older brother. I was very annoyed by that. <laughs> it seemed totally unfair. But, yeah. The reason yeah. I ask the question is oftentimes when I talk with people and they've had a fulfilling career, which I'm going to say, I think you have, um, <laughs> but many, many entrepreneurs have to go through a lot of iterations to get to that fulfilling career. Yeah. But oftentimes when they do, they find that the very thing that they enjoyed when they were little is what they're doing even today yeah. in some capacity. Yeah. That's very interesting. It is. It is. And so your, your ability to study and your love of books and, uh, yeah, and, learning. Outdoors yeah. and, and also holding your own with the men, holding your own with the boys, you yeah. know, when you think you are one, I mean, yeah, why not? I mean, that kind yeah. of attitude, I guess, huh. just comes to you naturally. In fact, I was very consciously a tomboy for, until I hit puberty, I guess, at which point I thought, oops, this is different. <laughs> I was, I was another side to boys that's much more interesting than my brothers. <laughs> I really had one other, in elementary school, there was only one other girl in my neighborhood, and she was more the Nancy Drew, and I was definitely more Trixie Belden. And her mother didn't even want us to hang out because she thought I would have a bad influence on her daughter. Which, you know, my my bad influence is I like to go out and bike and hang out and read in the trees and be outdoors. And, you know, mm -hmm. I came home when it got dark and that was just not their values. And that's fine. But, yeah, different. Nobody went to the dinner time. I mean, we were always out in the streets. In those days, it was. Yeah, there wasn't a, there wasn't a lot else to do for real. I mean, but and even television. It was just a different time. Dad would whistle us up, you know, yeah, from a couple of blocks away. <laughs> yeah. Well, we have some guests here in our in our um, watching live. Um, of course, we do this live on Mondays at at two p.m. Pacific, four p.m. Central time. Um, I'm going to just say uh, before we end this recording, then we'll take questions from our live audience so you're always welcome to join us live in fact you can still join us live if you come over to winwinwomen.tv if you have a question for Michaela or for me uh, we have a few more minutes here and we'd love to take your calls um so we uh Michaela do you have any final final thoughts or messages you want to share with our listening audience uh given the audience I would just say um don't be afraid of change because it almost always works out well for everybody. I mean, people get really worried about that when change is kind of imposed on them. But in fact, I have seen it turn out better time and time again. So I think it's definitely worth not being afraid of it. And and take chances, you know, try something different and just see what happens. You know? And mm -hmm. if it doesn't work, there is always something else to try. So don't worry about that. You know? One other message that you shared that I want to bring up that you shared is that, you know, sometimes the people just because they're in charge doesn't mean they know more than you and don't be, <laughs> be afraid to step up and just be like, I got this. So I appreciated that lesson as well. When I was a CEO, the people I really loved working with were the people who would talk to me, you know, about what they, they would say what was on their minds and not 
say what they thought I wanted to hear. Uh, and that's really valuable. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Michaela. It was so much fun hanging out with you again. Um, and congratulations on your book. I, maybe you'll have another one. Who knows? We'll see, right? I had an idea for one just the other day. Ah, there we go. Cool. Well, when that publishes, please come back and we'll do another, right? Sure, sounds cool. great. Well, thank you. And on behalf of Michaela and myself, I'd like to thank our audience for joining me and us on this journey. The purpose is to unleash your joyful business potential. That's why I talk with these amazing entrepreneurs, give you a little bit of inspiration and a little bit of like, oh, maybe I do have what it takes. Remember, leadership is a voyage and you can take it together with others in the same boat. So keep shining and aligning with your purpose and come on back next week and every week, 2 p.m. Pacific time exclusively on winwinwomen.tv where you can join our live audience and then of course we share the recording all over on podcasts and youtube and of course my website you can check out my website at leannelion.com l-e-a-n-n -N, five letters lion l-y is in yellow o-n four letters dot com uh, and learn more about everything that I'm doing in the world of entrepreneurship and to check out our next inspiring episode and guest. So until next time, this is Leanne Lyon, your Chief Joy Officer, signing off. Keep leading with heart and I'll catch you on the next wave of success. Farewell and keep spreading the joy.